Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Ambassador Catherine Tai, U.S. Trade Representative, and Concordia's Nicolas Logothetis. Well, hello everyone. It's great to be here with you in Miami. President Biden understands that putting working families first and strengthening our middle class is vital to our democracy and he's doing exactly those things. In the last two years, we have made historic investments to increase American competitiveness through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. We have also restored and revamped our engagement with longtime allies including deepening our collaboration with our partners in the Western Hemisphere, from Ottawa to Montevideo. We have some of our most long-standing trade agreements in this region, like our agreements with Chile, Colombia, and Peru, and also the Dominican Republic Central America FTA. But to take us to the next level, to lift up our workers, enhance fairness and equity, and strengthen democracy, we need to update our trade policies and that is exactly what we have been doing. Let's start with the USMCA, but you will see how the vision goes beyond that agreement as well. Almost three years ago now, we replaced the North American Free Trade Agreement with the updated and rebalanced US-Mexico-Canada Agreement. We went from having largely toothless side agreements on labor and environmental protections to concrete commitments and state-of-the-art cooperation and enforcement mechanisms. A great example is the rapid response mechanism, which allows us to take swift enforcement actions against specific facilities in Mexico that are not respecting freedom of association and collective bargaining rights as required under Mexican law. We have used the RRM, which we call it in shorthand, on numerous occasions to secure significant outcomes for workers. And this shows you the kind of positive impact trade can have when we work together. This also helps American workers and drives that race to the top by elevating labor standards across the region. Another important topic we're working on through the USMCA is resilience in North American trade. The COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's unjust, unprovoked attack on Ukraine highlighted and exacerbated vulnerabilities in many supply chains, leading to higher costs for manufacturers, farmers, businesses, and families across our region. So to help address this problem, the USMCA Free Trade Commission recently decided to create trilateral bodies to enhance our coordination to maintain trade flows in emergency situations. Beyond the USMCA, we have also worked closely with other partners in the region. We updated our agreements with Brazil and Ecuador with what we call protocols on trade rules and transparency. These protocols include new rules that could especially help smaller businesses compete and succeed, including things like good governance, transparent regulation, sustainable investment customs, and anti-corruption. As you can see, we're upgrading our existing relationships, not only for today, but also for our collective success and resilience tomorrow. Through that lens, it's fitting that I just flew back from Brazil last night. Over two days of inspired meetings in Brasilia, I met with several ministers, business leaders, and civil society stakeholder groups. And I left with a new appreciation for all that the United States and Brazil have in common. The Biden administration is committed to seizing this moment of alignment with the new Lula administration to deepen the US-Brazil trade relationship, strengthen our labor standards, protect the environment, and make trade policy more inclusive. One meeting with civil society groups really stood out to me. The participants shared their efforts to increase entrepreneurship for small businesses, especially women-owned ones. They also discussed challenges to creating economic opportunity for minorities, disabled people, and other disadvantaged communities. As I shared our own work and struggles on these same issues, I was reminded that the good fight we're fighting to use trade to champion the interests of everyday people is a universal one, and that partnership across borders is key to building a more resilient, sustainable, and inclusive tomorrow 
for our people. This is just the start of more engagement in the hemisphere, which brings me to the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity. We launched this partnership in January with 12 like-minded countries. As I said, the United States already has deep economic ties with the region, but this is something broader. It is our economic vision for the Western Hemisphere. USTR is leading on the trade aspects of the partnership, and it will not be a typical trade deal. It is an extension of our worker-centered trade policy anchored in cooperation to build our economies from the bottom up and the middle out. And it will have an open architecture for other countries that share our democratic values and our commitment to high standards. So we are creating new tools to address new problems that will shape the coming decades to better integrate our economies, reinforce our regional ties, and ensure that the benefits of trade are shared by all our people. Let's work together not only to tackle today's challenges, but also to seize tomorrow's opportunities. Our partnership throughout this hemisphere is instrumental to realizing this vision. And this really is a partnership, all of us pushing and pulling for each other. I look forward to working with many of you toward that goal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for those uh, very insightful remarks, Ambassador Catherine Tai, uh, welcome to Concordia. I think this is the first time you've joined us. Um, we're thrilled to have you here, um, especially off of a trip uh, to um, Brazil. And I don't know if you went to anywhere else or in the region or just Brazil. Um, but maybe you could start off by telling us a little bit about, uh, because this summit, this Concordia summit, is focused on the Americas, um, a little bit about the challenges that you're facing and opportunities that we're facing specifically as it relates to this region in terms of trade. What are you hearing from your counterparts uh, around the region? Uh, what are some exciting things, some concerning things? Just a general overview. Wonderful. Well, um, <clears throat> my trip to Brazil really reinforced for me uh, what a huge footprint in our region we have as the world's largest economy. Uh, but also, um, when you are in Brazil, uh, to see us and to see the, the Americas through the lens of the Brazilians, uh, who um, uh, have also a large country uh, of 200 million people, um, also a very significant footprint um, economically in this region, and to just think about where the opportunities are here. Expand that out to the entire Americas. Um, this is our home, this is our neighborhood, and uh, our historical ties, our cultural people ties run really, really deep. Um, I am convinced that uh, there is a lot of potential um, that um, uh, we need to seize right now um, to promote, uh, even beyond what we've done already, this regional integration, uh, to translate all of the historical, cultural, people-to-people um, -people ties into um, economic resilience. In terms of the partners in the region, um, uh, our region is quite diversified in terms of sizes of economies, uh, in terms of geography, uh, in terms of uh, levels of development. Um, I think that it is really critical for us through um, uh, the program of the America's Partnership uh, to think about um, not just our um, specific bilateral relationships or even kind of a regional through the Central America Dominican Republic arrangement, but really to start translating uh, these uh, platforms that we already have into a hemisphere-wide um, uh, program. Uh, for all of us to collaborate on addressing the significant challenges that we're facing right now in a very disrupted global economy uh, with a lot of challenges, but a, a lot of opportunities that come along with that. Yeah, um, and uh, our, uh, in addition to my role at Concordia, I um, op work with my family business, which is involved in shipping. And um, you know, I know the supply chain uh, has been a focus of yours and obviously things are repairing themselves, healing themselves, I think, from what we see. Um, and I think people are a little bit uh, sort of, uh, they, you know, they never want to be in a position where they can't buy toilet paper again, or <laughs> yes. uh, if you remember those days. So could you tell us a little bit about your work on, on the supply chain angle of this? I'd love to. 
So um, supply chains, when we talk about the supply chain challenge, um, there are a number of different facets of the challenge. One of them is the literal um, uh, disruptions and uh, discombobulation, if you will. Uh, so um, early on, um, not having enough goods, not being able to get them moving. Uh, and then as that kind of um, uh, toppled down, um, uh, the after effects of shipping containers all being in the wrong place um, <clears throat> and uh, the price spikes associated with that. So, you know, the clockwork of the global economy, once, you know, one piece goes out of sync, you start to see everything else um, um, you know, uh, fall into some disarray. Um, uh, There's a reason it's called a chain, right? Yeah, that is absolutely right. All of the links in the chain and that, that yeah. domino effect were really um, uh, significantly uh, troublesome for us uh, and, you know, um, economically hurtful. Um, <clears throat> the su uh, supply chain challenges we have around semiconductors, also that shortage, um, you know, I think everybody was impacted by that. And you start to discover how almost everything in our, in our lives has a little chip inside of it. Yeah. Um, you know, that we do see uh, some healing. We see um, uh, legislation that's been signed into law uh, to try to um, uh, recover and to put into place uh, guardrails and safeguards and better information systems. Um, the piece that really I spend a lot of time thinking about and that my team at USTR thinks about a lot is on um, the incentives for overall supply chain design. Mm. Um, uh, when we look at um, all of the troubles that we had during the pandemic, uh, a couple things stand out to us. One of them is that um, our supply chains suffer from vulnerabilities in a number of different areas. Uh, one of them is um, uh, over-concentration of um, uh, reliance uh, on uh, certain uh, production and supply coming from uh, certain regions, certain countries. <clears throat> Uh, another one on the other side is that um, some supply chains, you know, uh, we're so used to being able to get anything from anywhere very quickly, uh, are extremely complicated and uh, far flung so that, you know, any piece of that chain that falls apart will impact everything. So we're really thinking about how do we use trade tools to um, uh, modify the incentives for firm decision making in terms of sourcing, in terms of production, to uh, take into account that um, supply chains need to be not just efficient, they also need to be resilient. And here, what I would like to say is, um, as we think about those concentrations of supply and you know, um, uh, where supply chains are uh, and where they are not, um, I think that regionalization is going to be a really important part of responding to the supply chain challenges that we have and creating that resilience. If you are able for critical supply chains to ensure that you know, every region has a standing supply chain that's able to produce from start to finish, anytime you have a critical or catastrophic breakdown in one part of the world, the other parts of the world can uh, adapt to fill in the gap. So uh, again, the Americas, the Western Hemisphere, this is our region, this is our neighborhood, and I think that our partnerships need to be informed by this desire to um, <clears throat> modify the incentives and to leverage um, the creation of supply chains that run through the Americas. Yeah, no, your point about sort of it being very brittle is, is I always tell people that the Ever Given, the ship that uh, blocked the Suez Canal, uh, was like a, in, you know, a multiplier effect on the crisis. It was bought for six days and it made it you know, exponentially worse. Um, so we have to hopefully move beyond things like that. Yes. Um, if I could sort of turn back to uh, the domestic angle of things, I think you have a unique experience um, having worked uh, a lot with Republicans and Democrats. Um, you were confirmed 98 to zero by the Senate. Uh, in today's world, that's you know, a, a very notable thing. Um, have you... How would you describe the sort of current views in the Republican Party or, you know, uh, different views held uh, on trade? Have you sort of had discussions with the new Republican majority in the House? How are you feeling about that? And any, any insight you could give us, I'm sure, would be very well received. Certainly. Um... It is a real honor to have been confirmed 98-0, and I do not take that uh, lightly, and I never take it for granted. Um, I think that the key to driving sustainable, durable trade policy is to ensure that we are building 
as broad a base of support for it as possible. Um, in terms of um, uh, how I see and understand um, uh, Republican views on trade, I actually draw a lot on how I see and understand Democratic uh, views on trade, which is that um, uh, every senator, every member of Congress <clears throat> is uh, there to represent constituents. And um, um, the job that I have in the administration, just in the title, is the United States Trade Representative. And so that their constituents are also my constituents. Um, so uh, I think that the key is um, you, you can't construct durable trade policy if you ever shut out an entire segment of the American economy or a segment of um, the participants in the American economy. And so it is always about um, how you can thread the needle, <clears throat> how you can make sure that you are touching on uh, the interests of uh, as many uh, Americans as you can, um, whether they are Democrats or Republicans, whether they are you know, uh, urban Americans or rural Americans, uh, our responsibility is to build a trade policy that is going to work for the United States. Yeah. And my understanding is you, in your previous role, were heavily involved in the USMCA. Um, and, you know, I think that has been a generally well-received uh, agreement and, you know, sort of could uh, be a model for future ones. Yeah. I mean, could you tell us a little bit about the work you did on it? And if, uh, you know, it's somewhat of a model for bipartisan trade deals. Absolutely. I think the USMCA is very much the touchstone for what we talk about when we talk about a worker-centered trade policy. Um, <clears throat> let me say a couple things about the USMCA. First of all, um, um, uh, uh, renewing the NAFTA into the USMCA uh, was a really important exercise. I think it was um, scary and it was uh, um, quite an emotional roller coaster, the entire process. Um, but I think that it was really important inflection point in um, the evolution of US trade policy. Uh, because what we were doing was not just modernizing a trade deal, we were also taking in inputs for um, everyone who had benefited under it, who wanted to make sure that those bonds remained strong, but also everyone who felt like they had gotten the shorter end of the stick in the original deal, who wanted to find a way to um, make this deal better. And I think that um, uh, uh, some key elements to the USMCA are uh, to address those pressures around um, how our workers are treated. Um, that certainly um, uh, was a huge driver for the bipartisan support that you saw for the USMCA. And um, I really take pride in the fact that because of this rapid response enforcement mechanism, uh, we have been able to offer workers in Mexico, workers in the United States and Canada, a way, a, a tool through a trade agreement, which they have viewed and seen over time traditionally as um, uh, hostile to their interests. We are offering our workers a tool to uh, make better working conditions in Mexico to uh, make better the competitive pressures uh, between our economies. Um, and I think this very much guides uh, our vision for what we are trying to do, the partnerships that we are trying to build with uh, other countries. Um, in, in the few minutes we have left, I, uh, I, I know we're, we're here talking about Latin, Latin America, but if you will permit me, I think I have to ask one question about the U.S.-Chinese trading relationship, um, which obviously in the previous administration was a very hot topic, uh, less so at least publicly now. H how do you view the current relationship? Um, is there a risk or a you know, desire for decoupling? Um, and you know, is this gonna be something that, that we're talking about for a long time to come? So it's interesting how you've described it. I think it is still a hot topic in the sense that it is still a profoundly consequential aspect of um, US economic relations with the entire world. Um, less of a hot topic in the sense that it's less of uh, um, a, in, you know it's less a source for um, adrenaline these days, uh, which is also by design. I think that given the importance of this relationship, uh, we need to bring a very uh, deliberative, um, strategic, and um, long-term uh, view to how we navigate an incredibly challenging relationship. Um, <clears throat> 
China is right now the second largest economy in the world. <clears throat> um, every trading partner almost got a, should go back and look at the data uh, that we trade with also has a trading relationship with China. We also have a very significant trading relationship with China. I think that our view is that um, <clears throat> Part of the complexity and challenge of this relationship is um, a um, need to realign it. That there are distortions from the, the trajectory of this relationship that we need to correct for. And we are doing things on the domestic side, including investing in ourselves, in our infrastructure, in our research and development, in um, our own uh, ability to uh, break through and to, um, um, to uh, meet the challenges that uh, we're all facing in terms of uh, clean technology innovation, uh, while also um, uh, maintaining um, an economic system worldwide um, that can be resilient, sustainable, and inclusive. So the challenge is significant, but it is also the type of challenge that um, we're only going to meet successfully uh, by working with others. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was certainly very fascinating to, to hear you talk about this. And as you said, I think trade is, is uh, in, the, in the, you know, the past four years, administration was right on top of everyone's mind uh, because uh, it was, and now is less so, but is still no less important. So thank you for all the work you're doing on behalf of our country. Thank you for joining us at Concordia, and um, we wish you all the best. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I just want to assure you, a trade is at the top of my mind every single yes. day. <laughs> and thank you for the opportunity for um, addressing the audience here. Um, the issues are um, uh, as important as ever, uh, and this engagement is also as important as ever. Thank you. Thank you.